So if you can please welcome them and Alaska Native woman to earn a PhD in history. When I uh, finished my doctorate in 1984 at Stanford, um, I was going through a lot of, uh, what do you call it, uh, coming down, uh, you know, trying to get my mental health back, etc. And I thought, oh, I do such horrible research. I never found the women Alaska Native PhDs. And so I looked around for over three years. <laughs> Talk about a slow learner. I took a, I looked for three years, over three years, to find uh, some other Alaska Native women PhDs, and I, I was the only one. And um, the, uh, that continued until 1989, when Dr. Dorothy Pender, uh, whom I advised at Stanford in, electro in electrical engineering, like I really knew what I was talking about. <laughs> I was like that, you know, the uh, doll in the back of the car, you know, with the, oh yeah, sounds great. Um, and a, a Haida woman who got her doctorate at uh, the University of Minnesota in educational administration. And for a period after that, it was kind of slow. Um, they were very many people for a while. Uh, I was 84, they were 89, maybe 90, something like that. And uh, I kept waiting for more company. And who should show up here as a bride <laughs> was Jessica um, Bissette Perea, just finishing her doctorate, just in time for her um, lit review and all that good stuff, you know? <laughs> and I thought, ah, I can't wait. <laughs> and we made an agreement that what she would do, and this is what I recommend to all of you budding scholars that you do in your work, is that take a look around, look at your classmates, and keep track of each other. Because you're gonna meet, uh, I think the artists talk about it, uh, if I don't meet you on the way up, I'll meet you on the way down, <laughs> something like that. Um, and so what I asked of Jessica when I worked with her, I was so excited to see another Alaska native. When I heard that uh, Juan Carlos was going to marry an Athabascan, I thought, oh, Canadian, you know. But Alaskan, oh, man, I was really happy. Um, and um, what I asked Jessica to do was to keep track of the degrees of the Alaska Native people because there are not very many. And I will tell you how it looks from my perspective why there are not very many Alaska Native PhDs. The present graduation rate of Alaska Native students at the University of Alaska is 2%. We are between 20 and 25% of the population and for a public institution to have a 2% graduation rate, I believe that is called discrimination. That's not acceptable. Uh, in 1976, the 200th year of the anniversary of the Constitution, I think, the University of Alaska put out a media blitz that uh, they had doubled the native graduation rate. whoop de doo 2% to 4%. They lied. They took the associate, uh, uh, associate degrees from community colleges and mixed them with the bachelor's degrees and said that they doubled the graduation rate, which is unacceptable. That's different degrees, what have you. Um, so we have a serious lack of people power. We don't get through the pipeline of education. We start getting discriminated when they separate blue eyes and brown eyes in kindergarten. By third grade, who can read, who can't read, et cetera. So by the time we get all the way through this pipeline that they call, it gets pretty clogged up along the way. And so for, uh, for us to be PhDs, 
it's kind of miraculous. I don't think we did it on our own girls. I think we had a little help from, the, from people around us, plus I think the, real, the spirits really helped us out. My, uh, my, uh, I, I was born uh, in Bethel, Alaska, which is on the Cuscoquim River. It's in southwest Alaska. I was born there because it's, uh, the hospital is there, but my father's village was Crooked Creek, and my mother's village was Sleep Mew. And I lived uh, in and around Crooked Creek until I was about 10, and then moved to um, McGrath, which is a town um, further up the river, um, closer to Denali. My um, education, I was so excited about school, I couldn't stand it. I just really wanted to go to school. Uh, but we didn't have high schools. We didn't have high schools in the 50s. We didn't get high schools. We didn't get public high schools in Native communities until there was a lawsuit uh, in the 1960s. Uh, Molly Hooch versus the state of Alaska. She sued the state to have high schools. So what to do about my uh, uh, high school education was a real problem. So we started out with me being my freshman year in Park City, Montana, which was 30 miles west of Billings, which I understand is now part of Billings. Um, and so I had my freshman year there, and then I went three years to Holy Names Academy boarding school in Seattle. And so I got a college degree, which is a big <laughs> step along the way. And um, I was really excited. I applied for a scholarship to the University of Alaska because my grandfathers were pioneers. And I was so, you know, pioneers have a bunch of scholarship money, so I applied for that. Um, got a letter back from the Dean of Women, said, well, that's not really relevant for you. I have sent you uh, an application that will, um, is more uh, tuned to, to your needs. And it was a Bureau of Indian Affairs form, and I got a scholarship for $300, and I was just in heaven. I just couldn't believe it. I was so happy. I got to the University of Alaska, and uh, I almost flunked out. I started out with a pink slip. I couldn't believe it. I was flunking out of biology. I just I couldn't stand it, and I wanted to be a teacher. And my first um, advisor was the dean of education. When he was talking to me, he said, um, you know, we were having actually what I considered a pretty good talk. It was, it was pretty formal, but I knew how to do an appointment. And at the end of it, when he was kind of picking up his papers, he looked at me and said, well, you know you're never going to graduate. And I thought, ooh, I don't think that's the right thing. I don't think that's right. Well, it turns out that there was a professor named Ivor Scarlin in anthropology who took all of these rejects from education, these native rejects, and made us anthropology majors. Like, we're going to really have a career with anthropology. <laughs> it was, we didn't even know what it was, some of us. But um, it, my aunt said, if it'll keep you in college, do it. Whatever. OK. So I had a really, really hard time getting through. By the time my friend Lenny Hamilton and I were um, juniors, the people from the registration table would look up at us and say, you still here? <laughs> and uh, whatever. And so it took us a long time. And what turned out, the thing that got me and Lenny through was we, I was scared of my aunt, and he was scared of his mother. <laughs> And it was easier not to go home, <laughs> no matter how bad it was. I mean, I think students can relate to this. Um, so I stuck it out and managed to pick up a Bachelor of Arts degree in 1964. And by that time, I figured out there was this thing called graduate school, that you get master's degrees and PhD degrees and M, uh, MD degrees and JD degrees, and I thought, I am going to have some of that. And so I started taking whatever graduate courses I could find. And uh, in a nine year period, I had amassed 19 units in uh, graduate credits, but nobody would put them in a master's degree. And then somebody said to me, I don't think you're going to get in. And I thought, yeah, there's a trend there. He said, you know what you should do? You should go to Harvard. 
And I said, oh yeah, I can't get into the University of Alaska. I should go to Harvard. Why should I do that? And he said, they have an Indian program. Perked up. <laughs> and, like, Ooh. and it turned out that the Indian program at Harvard, which was only a couple of years old, was headed by an Alaska Native man. <laughs> And uh, people teased me that he saw the postmark on my, on my <laughs> envelope and I was in. And so in 1972, I moved my family to Cambridge. And in one year, with eight units, I had, I mean, eight cre uh, courses, I had a master's degree. Well, by then, I thought, well, I want this PhD thing. I want to do some more. And, um, so I, I actually left Cambridge. I, I, I don't know. Harvard was just, I don't know, east of the Mississippi. It's okay, but you know, uh, I'm a Western person. And so I decided that I would um, enroll at Stanford as a um, PhD student. Stanford did not tell me in my award letter that I had uh, tuition for one year only. And I did not qualify for any scholarships there because I was over 25. <laughs> I know, the Vicki Carr Scholarship. You had to be 25 or older, excuse me. <laughs> you know. And so I had to hustle and try to get a scholarship from uh, a national source. And I, I, the only two scholarships I could find were the um, Native American Ford Fellowship and the Danforth scholarship for women. And the Danforth scholarship had been established because the Danforth Foundation had not awarded women PhD scholarships for 10 years because women were always doing disorganized things like having babies and raising them and stuff and dropped out of their programs. Mm -hmm. Well then they, they were forced to make a scholarship for women which women were over 30 and had stopped out for family. So there I was. I was actually discouraged at Stanford from applying for that one because that one was considered the best and the Native American Ford was only for Indians. I walked out of that office and I applied for both of them. And I got them both and then the fun began because I had to, I had to um, supplement my income. So I spent um, three years at uh, your institution at UC Berkeley teaching in Native American studies. And an Indian woman came from San Francisco State and said, we're looking for an Indian, we can tenure. <laughs> Without looking at the salary schedule, I raised my hand. <laughs> and I came here, and um, I met Juan Carlos at the same age as uh, his daughter today. Uh, and I've been here ever since. I, I seem to do pretty well in a union shop, let's put it that way. <laughs> um, and, I became chair of American Indian Studies at the same year that I became an assistant professor. I did not have my doctorate yet. I had three years to finish everything, or I was going to have a one-year grace period, and then I was supposed to go find a job someplace. So by every means necessary, as Malcolm X said, by any means necessary, um, I did finish my doctorate in 1984 and got my tenure and um, moved through the uh, assistant professor to associate to full professor. I was full professor for nine years and then huh, I turned 60, put in 20 years and I retired. And uh, people say, what do you do when you retire? I don't know what other people do, but I go to parties. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's been quite a journey. The year that my son and I, he got his bachelor's degree and I got my PhD in 1984. We changed the national statistics mm -hmm. of achievement in the country. That's how rare it all is, okay? So if you don't see Native people in the faculty, these are some of the reasons why. Now, it turns out that I really like writing curriculum. It turns out that all of the spirits children need curriculum. And so we worked on women's studies, and we worked on labor studies, we did all kinds of uh, and ethnic studies, we were putting everything together for that. And um, I actually taught a number of my courses, both at Berkeley and here, um, from novels at the beginning, because there really wasn't much. And um, <coughs> there's been 
there's a lot more scholarship available now. There are more people, but we do need more um, people in the business. It's hard work. You will not be paid well. You'll be paid, you know, and you'll be given status when you ask for something. But you will not be paid well, but um, you will be building uh, a presence of a perspective of life that is very much needed in this world. It's, it's dire. Um, I brought a few things with me. Um, this is a book. This is to give you an example of how endangered we were in, at the University of Alaska, we native students. This is by my classmate, Willie Hensley. He, he's written three books now. He and I and six other Native students took a seminar at the University of Alaska from Chief Justice Jay Rabinowitz. And we wrote, um, we wrote term papers. I wrote my term paper on adopted out Native children. Mm -hmm. Willie wrote his on the Alaska Native land claims. Mm -hmm. His term paper on Alaska Native land claims became our land claims in 1979. That's what a term paper can do. <laughs> okay, uh, This is a book called Village Journey, and it's quite a historical piece. It's um, the man traveled from the Circumpolar Inuit Conference. He traveled around Alaska and interviewed people, took pictures, and wrote stories. And it's quite a, I happen to find it today. It's really quite a, um, it's, it's very nostalgic, um, and it always makes me homesick. I'll say no more about that. Uh, and then this is a Xerox of my dissertation, uh, two pages to a page, and it uh, kind of blurs after a while. But it is the first Alaska Native woman PhD, period. And that's my story. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. This is an amazing crowd to have when it's 93 degrees out. <laughs> so thank you for coming and making the time. Um, Joanne, thank you for thinking it was um, important to have a panel on Alaska Native Studies. Um, really appreciate that. And I want to say a little bit more about why that's important, but I want to acknowledge you for thinking about it and making this first. That's really meaningful. Thank you. And I also need to say a word about the company I'm in. It's such an honor to be on this panel, and I want to acknowledge Betty for creating a space for Alaska Native people, not only in the Bay Area, but in academia in general. Like, we're all here, partly because of you, so thank you for that. Um, Jessica, I met Jessica, I came to Berkeley eight years ago, and I met you in my first term. And it's a very lonely place for Alaska Native scholars, and just knowing you and learning about your fantastic work has been very sustaining for me. So thank you for who you are and everything you do. So you have all the generations here. We have the first Alaska Native PhD, and we have the most recent one sitting right here. Oh. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> PhD from Berkeley, um, going on to University of Wisconsin next year. They made a job for her. Incredible for a new PhD. So um, it's wonderful to have. This is our future right here. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so one of the frustrations about being in Native American studies is that there is extraordinarily little attention paid to Alaska Native issues, mm -hmm. despite the importance of Alaska. So Alaska is a place that has a very large Native population. As you mentioned, it's 20-25% of the overall population of Alaska, 120,000 plus um, Alaska Native people speaking 20 different languages. We had uh, the largest indigenous land claim settlement in U.S. history. It's big. I'm going to say a little bit more about that. Um, there are pressing issues that confront Alaska Native people that really resonate with um, Native issues in the lower 48. So things like land conflicts, um, what sovereignty and self-determination mean in that particular context, hunting and fishing rights, major issues in Alaska because so many people depend on subsistence to live, mm -hmm. unlike in many places in the lower 48. Um, a lot going on with regard to language revitalization, health, um, 
the importance of climate issues on tribal rights. So there's um, much to be learned there about issues that affect all <coughs> Native communities. But at the same time, Alaska is a place that's very different in key ways. And it's important for us to think about the places across Native America that are different, in part because they, under, they expand our sense of what it means to be Native. What are the sort of political and historical issues that define um, the Native condition? And within academia, um, those places change the paradigms that we have, the scholarly paradigms we have. So I want to take the 50th anniversary um, as a moment for thinking about some of those similarities and differences and why they matter. So, you know, we're celebrating um, 50 years of something that I'll mention in a moment. In Alaska, we're also celebrating our own 50th. Um, and that celebration brings to light some of the ways in which we're similar to and different from other Native communities. So the thing that we're all celebrating in the Bay Area is the emergence of ethics studies 50 years ago, first here. So that's amazing. Um, second in Berkeley. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> was that the same time? <laughs> same time. Well, I think we were 69. I mean, we're doing our 50th year this year, too. Okay, so we're all celebrating. <laughs> I'm exciting about the Bay Area, but here first. So, so here, here first. I want to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, right, we're out there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Okay, so the struggle for ethnic studies emerged out of broader activist campaigns in Native America that took the form of struggles for treaty rights and land rights. And those of you who have worked in Native studies know that two things distinguish Native people from other racialized people. And those are um, rights to the land that emerge from being the people who were here first, right? There's something called the Aboriginal title that um, is the basis on which um, aboriginal indigenous land rights are claimed. And also rights to self-determination that again come from being um, um, communities, independent, self-determined communities before colonization. And that that history is the basis for um, native claims um, still. So what we saw going on in the 1960s and 70s were um, Native claims based on those issues. Like we had the fishing rights um, in the Pacific Northwest that arguably was the beginning of red power, depending on um, the history that you look at. The occupation of Alcatraz here, 1969 to 1971. The occupation of the BIA, um, 1972, that was the end of the Trail of Broken Trees. So all of these issues, um, all of these forms of activism that were designed to call attention um, to Native rights, especially land rights and um, sovereignty rights. Well, Alaska 50 years ago was undergoing a parallel struggle um, for land rights, but that struggle took place in a very different context. Different histories came to bear on it, and it had a very different outcome. So I want to say a little bit about the form that that struggle t um, took and how it compares to what was going on in the lower 48 at the time. So Alaska Native people started organizing in the 1960s, but they did so in an entirely different historical context. So when we think about the colonization of Native America, Native North America, we think about the English coming from the East, California, it's the Spanish coming from the South. Um, well, for Alaska, and actually, some places in California as well, is the Russians, right? The Russians first colonized Alaska, arriving in the um, 1830s. Uh, so, sorry, 1730s, early 18th century. But they came to Alaska not to settle it. So this wasn't settler colonialism. Um, they came um, in search of resources. And that quest for resources, repeated over and over and over again throughout Alaska history, has been really definitive in defining the contemporary situation of Alaska Native people and the terrain on which struggles for um, Native rights occur. So the Russians came in search of furs. And um, in the process, they enslaved Alaska Native people in the coastal areas, so mostly Aleut people. So there's a history of Native slavery that connects with other histories of Native slavery um, within and beyond the United States. Um, they had a dramatic effect on um, the population of fur bearing mammals. So the sea otter is almost driven to extinction because of the Russians. Um, so they came and they did that, and about 140 years or so passed um, before they decided that they were going to 
sell Alaska, and they sell Alaska to the United States in 1869, um, which was a great shock to the native people who lived there, right? Because Russians, <laughs> at any one time, there were no more than about a thousand Russians in Alaska. And Alaska is a huge place. It's one fifth the size of the continental United States. Alaska has more shoreline than the rest of the United States combined. And there are only a thousand of them, right? So how did they get to sell this place? Nevertheless, this happened, and they sold Alaska um, to the United States. And a lot, quite a bit of time passes, 1867. So some decades pass before very much changes. Like, no one really wants to move there. It's super cold, right? So not a lot of people go up there until early to the mid um, 20th century. So this is another key difference about Alaska, that white settlement happened much, much later mm. than it did elsewhere. And there are people today, so Jen and I are working together on a community history of Alaska Native land claims. And we've been interviewing people who tell these amazing stories. And you know, a couple of people had told stories about the first time I saw a white person. Like, when does that happen anywhere else, right? So this is a very recent history. And that um, matters. That makes Alaska quite distinct. The fact that this history was so recent means that things like epidemics are also very recent. So epidemics in Alaska lasted at least through the 1950s. And so the people in my parents' generation you know, tell stories about the epidemics in the villages. So my dad grew up in a small native village in interior Alaska. And from the time I was a kid, he would tell stories about um, you know, being in the village, and at that time the epidemic was tuberculosis. And he would say, you know, kids would start coughing blood. And a year later, we knew that within a year they would be dead. And there's a cemetery, the village is called Nalato, that has um, graves of children. And I've been to that cemetery. And that's you know, the legacy of, um, that was the sort of fact of life then, that the mm -hmm. epidemics were, were that recent in the memory of my parents' generation. Um, that has had a kind of dramatic effect. I was working a couple of years ago on a project with our tribal health organization. Um, and the fact of that trauma being so recent, right, has health effects that continue um, to this day. Um, effects experiences of um, Native people. So Betty mentioned the Molly Hooch um, decision. The fact that in the villages where most Native people lived until 60s or 70s, maybe a little bit later, um, were so dispersed, so um, geographically distant from any urban center meant that education wasn't available in the villages. And so boarding schools um, the it's a very recent history in our community as well. So again, that's my parents' generation. Like all my aunts and uncles went to boarding schools. So here we're like Canada, right? Where boarding schools continued until the um, 1990s. Boarding schools are very recent um, history here with all of that, everything that that implies, you know? The loss of family, the loss of culture, um, the kind of collective grief in communities. Um, one of the interviews I did a couple of years ago in this health project was with someone who said that um, she was talking about her grandmother's experience and her grandmother talking about how all those generations in um, communities, the children being taken away, um, had such a you know terrible effect on the people that remained. And I'll never forget what she said. She said, it got so quiet when all the children left. So we think about what yeah, <laughs> you know, the effects on children of being taken away, but what happens to the people who remain? And that, too, is a very sort of recent um, and live history. Another thing that people don't know about Alaska is that Alaska, until the mid-20th century, was had a system of Jim Crow-style segregation. Did anyone know that? It was like Jim Crow in Alaska. And there was a journalist who came to Alaska to study this who wrote this um, article saying, well, you know, I've been to Mississippi and it's as bad here as it was there. And that, again, is my parents' generation. So, you know, my dad talks about moving to Anchorage as a teenager and no dogs or Indians allowed. That was the sign on um, a lot of establishments. You go to the theater, you have to sit upstairs. You can't sit in the main area. Um, and so that draws us into relation with actually some Native communities in the Southeast. Um, experience segregation in the same way, but not a lot of other Native communities have that particular experience. Um, 
colonization in Alaska looked like all of these things. Um, it really took the form of gradual encroachment, right? So all these people are coming to Alaska drawn by um, resources of various kinds. Um, first it's the Russians coming for furs. In the late 19th century, um, fisheries started, so fish became a resource that was sought, of, sought after. Um, massive gold rush in Alaska in um, the end of the 19th century, 1899, 1898, 99. The gold rush started, I think there was something like 200,000 people who went up to Alaska in search of gold. Mm -hmm. Very dramatic effect on native communities. And here are histories like the history of California, right, 50 years earlier. Um, the same kinds of devastations that Native California communities experienced, Alaska Native people did as well. Um, and then oil. I will say more about that in a minute. Um, but the fact that colonization took this form means there were no full scale wars, there were military conflicts of various kinds, there were no treaties. So Alaska Natives have a different and ambiguous political status. And I would urge you all to read Jen's dissertation, <laughs> which talks a lot about this, how Alaska Native rights to land, to sovereignty, aren't codified in the same way that they are for many, not all, um, other Native groups in the lower 48. And that has sort of changed everything um, for Alaska Native people and Alaska Native politics. So in the 1960s, um, Native people, so here we're getting to the 50th, what we're celebrating 50 years later, um, started to come together to lobby for land rights. And this is one of the um, things that we're focusing on in this um, community history that we're working on. And the issue of how they knew how to do that has been a fascinating one to me, right? Because most Alaska Native people, again, were from villages, 220, 229 Alaska Native villages, some of them were remote, many of them not on the road system at all. Um, not a lot of formal education, right? Like our people have been, had access to education much later and much less frequently than um, any other people. At the time of the land crime settlement, the life expectancy for Alaska Native people was 38. Um, so how did these people in that generation know that they had a land claim, that there was mm -hmm. some kind of legal basis, right? It's an interesting question. And you know, people tell different stories about that, but one of the stories they tell is about boarding schools. So they went to boarding schools, not only in Alaska, but they came down to the lower 48s in places like Chihuahua. And they started to learn like not only what Alaska Native people had in common, which wasn't even a category, right? Like you were your own tribal identity, you weren't Alaska Native. So Alaska Native starts to have some meaning, that we have some commonalities across tribal and cultural linguistic differences, but also we have something in common with the people who live here. And boarding school was one way in which they saw like, okay, one of the things that we have in common is land loss. And their contacts with people outside of um, Alaska was one way, there were others, but they came to learn that there's something you can do about it. So Alaska Native people started to organize in the 1960s and formed in 1966 the Alaska Federation of Natives. So this sort of pan-tribal Alaska Native organization that remains the most um, the prominent Alaska Native political organization today. AFN was formed to um, get land rights for Alaska Native people. So they formed in 1966. And in 1968, a sort of but, you know, fortuitous in some way that it takes place. And that is the discovery of oil at Prudhoe Bay. So Prudhoe Bay is on the north slope of Alaska. It remains the largest um, oil field in North America. So it's this massive discovery. Okay, so Prudhoe Bay is on the north slope um, in what used to be a place that was blocked by ice, now melting, right? Like you couldn't get oil tankers up there. Um, and so to transport the oil to the lower 48 where the market is, they were going to have to build a pipeline from the northern part of Alaska to Valdez 800 miles later across native land. And this became the key for native people organizing to say like, those are our lands. You are not gonna let you build a pipeline until land rights are settled. And they went to the courts and the courts agreed and so a lot of people think that had oil not been discovered in Alaska, we wouldn't have had a land claim. 
So that land claim, the land claim passed in 1971, and again, it's the largest um, indigenous land claim in US history, it was um, 44 million acres, about a ninth of the state, um, about a billion dollars, which sounds pretty great, except that <laughs> the form that the land claim took was pretty complicated. I'm just gonna say a few words about that before I stop. Um, so okay, Congress decides, okay, we have to do this land claim if we want the pipeline to be built. But context is the termination era, right? It's the 1960s. And they say, um, you know, we're just not willing to acknowledge Alaska Native as you know, people as tribes, and we're not willing to establish reservations. Like we're trying to get rid of all that, we're not going to do that. So Alaska Native people, for their part, you know, look down south and they see Indian country like not being a very desirable place to be, right? Like this, this is a pretty dire era. And some of them, there, there were a lot of divisions about what form land claims should take, but you know, one argument is like, well, we don't want to be in their situation. Like, you know, the BIA is over everything and there's a lot of poverty and so on. So the compromise ended up being that um, for-profit corporations would be established to hold the land. Um, and that really this was termination legislation, at least as I see it, because those corporations were only supposed to be in existence for 25 years, held by Alaska Native people. And then um, that's long enough for them to assimilate, right, and kind of go away. And in 25 years, they'll be open to the public, and they'll be sold, and they'll just be like regular corporations. So that was the original deal. Um, one of the interesting things, and I'm actually quoting my dad here, who says, like, well, he said, one of the things we knew was that, you know, treaties can't be changed, but legislation can. So all I'll say about that is that the corporations didn't go away, and they weren't open to um, purchase by non-Native people. They're still held by Alaska Natives, and that they have served some kind of interesting, contradictory roles um, that include aligning Alaska Native interests with those of corporate America, but at the same time giving um, Alaska Native people resources to do other things. Right, to have like major political influence in the state. Um, to lift people out of poverty, right? Like think about this, there's Jim Crow segregation, people were very poor, you know, they've been dispossessed of resources. During the gold rush, Alaska Natives can't, they can dig gold, they can't own it, you can't, you know. So there were all these ways of dispossessing Alaska Native people that resulted in a lot of poverty. So corporations provide resources, right? I personally would not be in this room, I would not have had education without that land claim settlement. There were funds for education, right? Um, but it's created a kind of complicated political situation in which we now exist. You know, what are the limits and possibilities of the corporate model? It affects experiences of um, Native people. So Betty mentioned the Molly Hooch um, decision, the fact that in the villages where most Native people lived until 60s or 70s, maybe a little bit later, um, were so dispersed, so um, geographically distant from any urban center meant that education wasn't available in the villages. And so boarding schools um, is a very recent history in our community as well. So again, that's my parents' generation. Like all my aunts and uncles went to boarding schools. So here we're like Canada, right? Where boarding schools continued until the um, 1990s. Boarding schools are very recent um, history here with all of that, everything that that implies, you know? The loss of family, the loss of culture, um, the kind of collective grief in communities. Um, one of the interviews I did a couple of years ago in this health project was with someone who said that um, she was talking about her grandmother's experience and her grandmother talking about how all those generations in um, communities, the children being taken away, um, had such a you know terrible effect on the people that remained. And I'll never forget what she said. She said, it got so quiet when all the children left. Mm -hmm. So we think about what, yeah, <laughs> you know, the effects on children of being taken away, but what happens to the people who remain? And that too is a very sort of recent um, and live history. Another thing that people don't know about Alaska is that Alaska until the mid 20th century was, had a system of Jim Crow style segregation. Did anyone know that? Like Jim Crow in Alaska. 
And there was a journalist who came to Alaska to study this who wrote this um, article saying, well, you know, I've been to Mississippi and it's as bad here as it was there. And that, again, is my parents' generation. So, you know, my dad talks about moving to Anchorage as a teenager and no dogs or Indians allowed. That was the sign on um, a lot of establishments. You go to the theater, you have to sit upstairs. You can't sit in the main area. Um, and so that draws us into relation with actually some Native communities in the Southeast um, experience segregation in the same way, but not a lot of other Native communities have that particular experience. Um, colonization in Alaska looked like all of these things. Um, it really took the form of gradual encroachment, right? So all these people are coming to Alaska drawn by um, resources of various kinds. Um, first is the Russians coming for furs. In the late 19th century, um, fisheries started, so fish became a resource that would sought of, get sought after. Um, massive gold rush in Alaska in um, the end of the 19th century, 1899, 1898, 99. The gold rush started, I think there was something like 200,000 people who went up to Alaska in search of gold. Mm -hmm. Very dramatic effect on native communities. And here are histories like the history of California, right, 50 years earlier. Um, the same kinds of devastations that Native Californian communities experienced, Alaska Native people did as well. Um, and then oil. I'm going to say more about that in a minute. Um, but the fact that colonization took this form means there were no full scale wars, there were military conflicts of various kinds, there were no treaties. So Alaska Natives have a different and ambiguous political status. And I would urge you all to read Jen's dissertation, <laughs> which talks a lot about this, how Alaska Native rights to land, to sovereignty, aren't codified in the same way that they are for many, not all, um, other Native groups in the lower 48. And that has sort of changed everything um, for Alaska Native people and Alaska Native politics. So in the 1960s, um, Native people, so here we're getting to the 50th, what we're celebrating 50 years later, um, started to come together to lobby for land rights. And this is one of the um, things that we're focusing on in this um, community history that we're working on. And the issue of how they knew how to do that has been a fascinating one to me, right? Because most Alaska Native people, again, were from villages, 220, 229 Alaska Native villages, some of them were remote, many of them not on the road system at all. Um, not a lot of formal education, right? Like our people have been, had access to education much later and much less frequently than um, any other people. At the time of the land claim settlement, the life expectancy for Alaska Native people was 38. Um, so how did these people in that generation know that they had a land claim, that there was mm -hmm. some kind of legal basis, right? It's an interesting question. And you know, people tell different stories about that, but one of the stories they tell is about boarding schools. So they went to boarding schools not only in Alaska, but they came down to the lower 48s in places like Chamawa. And they started to learn like not only what Alaska Native people had in common, which wasn't even a category, right? Like you were your own tribal identity, you weren't Alaska Native. So Alaska Native starts to have some meaning, that we have some commonalities across tribal and cultural and linguistic differences, but also we have something in common with the people who live here. And boarding school was one way in which they saw like, okay, one of the things that we have in common is land loss. And their contacts with people outside of um, Alaska was one way, there were others, but they came to learn that there's something you can do about it. So Alaska Native people started to organize in the 1960s and formed in 1966 the Alaska Federation of Natives. So this sort of pan-tribal Alaska Native organization that remains the most um, the prominent Alaska Native political organization today. AFN was formed to um, get land rights for Alaska Native people. So they formed in 1966. And in 1968, a sort of but, you know, fortuitous in some way that it takes place, and that is the discovery of oil at Prudhoe Bay. So Prudhoe Bay is on the north slope of Alaska. It remains the largest um, oil field in North America, so it's this massive discovery. Okay, so Prudhoe Bay is on the north slope um, in what used to be a place that was blocked by ice, now melting, right? Like you couldn't, 
get oil tankers up there. Um, and so to transport the oil to the lower 48 where the market is, they were going to have to build a pipeline from the northern part of Alaska to Valdez 800 miles later across native land. And this became the key for native people organizing to say, like, those are our lands. You are not going to let you build a pipeline until land rights are settled. And they went to the courts, and the courts agreed. And so a lot of people think that had oil not been discovered in Alaska, we wouldn't have had a land claim. So that land claim, the land claim passed in 1971, and again, it's the largest um, indigenous land claim in US history was um, 44 million acres, about a ninth of the state, um, about a billion dollars, which sounds pretty great, except that <laughs> the form that the land claim took was pretty complicated. I'm just gonna say a few words about that before I stop. Um, so okay, Congress decides, okay, we have to do this land claim if we want the pipeline to be built. But context is the termination era, right? It's the 1960s. And they say, um, you know, we're just not willing to acknowledge Alaska Native as you know, many people as tribes. And we're not willing to establish reservations. Like, we're trying to get rid of all that. We're not going to do that. So Alaska Native people, for their part, you know, look down south, and they see Indian country, like, not being a very desirable place to be, right? Like, this, this is a pretty dire era. And some of them, there, there were a lot of divisions about what form land claims should take, but you know, one argument is, like, well, we don't want to be in their situation. Like, you know, the BIA is over everything, and there's a lot of poverty and so on. So the compromise ended up being that um, for-profit corporations would be established to hold the land. Um, and that really this was termination legislation, at least as I see it, because those corporations were only supposed to be in existence for 25 years, held by Alaska Native people, and then um, that's not long enough for them to assimilate, right, and kind of go away. And in 25 years, they'll be open to the public, and they'll be sold, and they'll just be like regular corporations. So that was the original deal. Um, one of the interesting things, and I'm actually quoting my dad here, who says, like, well, he said, one of the things we knew was that, you know, treaties can't be changed, but legislation can. So all I'll say about that is that the corporations didn't go away, and they weren't open to um, purchase by non-Native people. They're still held by Alaska Natives, and that they have served some kind of interesting, contradictory roles. Um, that include aligning Alaska Native interests with those of corporate America, but at the same time giving um, Alaska Native people resources to do other things, right? To have like major political influence in the state. Um, to lift people out of poverty, right? Like think about this, there's Jim Crow segregation, people were very poor, you know, they've been dispossessed of resources. During the gold rush, Alaska Natives can't, they can dig gold, they can't own it, you can't, you know. So there were all these ways of dispossessing Alaska Native people that resulted in a lot of poverty. So corporations provide resources, right? I personally would not be in this room. I would not have had education without that land claim settlement. There were funds for education, right? Um, but it's created a kind of complicated political situation in which we now exist. You know, what are the limits and possibilities of the corporate model sovereignty look like in this model? So those are some of the issues that we're confronting. There's actually a retribalization movement going on in Alaska that's kind of um, working against the corporate model. Um, but this is the um, political world we live in, which in some ways is like analogous to what's going on in the lower 48, but in some ways it's very different. this many people uh, wanting to talk about Alaska, it's rare. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I also want to start by uh, thanking and acknowledging uh, my panelists up here. Um, when I moved to the Bay Area, uh, followed, uh, following my heart, Mary John Carlos, who's here in the front row, uh, whose family is very much uh, ensconced in this 50th anniversary uh, commemorations that um, I didn't really know anything about the history. So it's really been, um, something of a whirlwind tour the last decade of, of learning and listening and 
putting into conversation the kinds of experiences I had um, growing up in, in the Anchorage area, which I'll talk about in a minute. But um, when I first got here, Betty was one of the first people uh, that my family brought me to, which was wonderful because I think um, part of what was so alienating about getting a PhD, even though I'm in like the, the third or fourth generation of Alaska Native PhDs, which I have um, a printout that I'd like to pass around. I didn't print out a lot, so maybe you could share them with your neighbor. Um, pass them around if you, if you don't want to keep it, pass it on. Um, because I think what, um, in, in kind of talking with Betty and thinking about what this list could do, um, it really, for me, created what some academics might call a, an imagined community, right? That um, doing any kind of school, undergraduate, master's, PhD, if you're away from home, it's, it's not unlike, I imagine, some of the boarding school experiences that our ancestors went through that you're alone. I was in a musicology department. What you'll see on this list is um, not a lot of ethnic studies. A lot of our, our density in terms of our intellectual history of Alaska Native uh, research researchers is that we, um, not only were we educated down here, because there weren't opportunities, as Betty mentioned, in Alaska. Um, of this list, with, there are, um, it's still being updated, there are 99 listed with Jen Rose being 99, but we do have, I think, 100, 101 now, and we're still kind of updating it with the uh, lower 48 PhDs. But only 25% of PhDs are earned in Alaska over a 50-year period. We're approaching the 50th anniversary of the first Alaska Native PhD, my aunt and relation, uh, James Simpson. And so it's, it's just, it's kind of an, a phenomenal thing to think about what it means to be in the Bay Area as Alaska Native, that Betty was here making history as the first tenured American Indian person, not, let alone Alaska Native mm -hmm. faculty member here at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but then and I, I knew Sherry's family growing up because Sherry's father was the uh, CEO and president of the Siri Corporation. The Siri uh, Native Corporation uh, is based in Anchorage and it's probably, I would say, the most intertribal mm -hmm. of all of them because the corporations were mapped onto cultural areas. And so if you look at a language map for Alaska, they roughly follow, you know, 12 corporations in the state and a 13th for, for those in the diaspora. But, um, I, yeah, Sherry's, Sherry's dad was, was the president of our corporation, and as an afterborn, somebody who was born after the signing of ANCSA, um, that's, our, that's our terminology, it's pretty, pretty horrific when you think about it. Um, and we still, there are some of the things that Sherry was mentioning in terms of the the things that still need to be fixed across the corporations is the incorporation and enfranchisement of those of us that were born after the signing, right? So I grew up in a very interesting place, being intertribal, although it was my ancestral land. So I'm the nine. I was born and raised in, uh, born in Anchorage, raised uh, in, in what has become uh, infamous through Sarah Island, uh, Wasilla Palmer area. Um, it is as bad as you think. Uh, we have some, some people who can attest to that. But all of us would agree. Yeah. <laughs> Nine out of ten Alaska Natives agree Wasilla was not so great. Um, and so growing up with also a mother who was adopted out, she was taken. Uh, and what that kind of trauma means. That's one of the things that I, I agree wholeheartedly with, with what Sherry was explaining in terms of our traumas are very recent traumas. Our histories with colonization and settler colonialism more specifically are very recent. Um, and when we think about, we don't tend to talk about things like stolen generations of, a lot of Native Americans in the US. We talk about that in Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, but um, there was a huge, <laughs> child grab, grabbing of children, stealing of children, and my mother was part of that. And so growing up in the shadow of the corporation, thinking that that was what defined you as a native was, you know, 20 years later, uh, tw being down here I've been in the lower 48 for 20 years now, um, is pretty, it's just, it's something that's kind of mind-blowing. If I had my head exploding emoji, that would be what you would right there. But um, what I want to um, think about, and, and I was, I, I don't think it could have been per more perfect timing for Berkeley to have courted Sherry at the time that they did, because we, I started a postdoc, the one that Jen Rose has now, uh, <laughs> at Berkeley in the music department, the same year that they, that they hired Sherry. And so all of this 
this list, which I think becomes an important marker, again, of our presence in the lower 48, our involvement in different kinds of intellectual histories here, uh, and our continued efforts when we get hired in departments that maybe we weren't trained to be uh, working in, such as Native Studies. Um, you'll notice on this list, uh, Indigenous Studies or even Ethnic Studies, I think the first one that was awarded might have been to um, Diane in 2004, she went Berkeley. So even though we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of ethnic studies and these programs that uh, Berkeley and Davis have in PhD programs, you know, it's, it's still very recent that we even have people trained in this kind of work, that it is a very interdisciplinary, intertribal endeavor. Um, I think that uh, the, the importance of um, thinking about uh, resource extraction, and, and I, we were talking at lunch about um, the significance of Molly of Denali coming up this year, <laughs> um, which I, I get to watch with my daughter, which is wonderful, and I, I was thinking here as we're sitting here that really if we were to reimagine what a show centered on Betty might look like in terms of Betty of Academia, <laughs> <laughs> she is the reason, again, that, that we're able to be here and have this panel in the first place, you know, so thank you again, Joanne. For, for inviting us. Um, I guess I also want to acknowledge that we have our first ever uh, Alaska Native PhD students at, at UC Davis who, who drove out here with another Alaska Native Studies scholar as well in the making. So it's, I, and I want to say that I think that Jen studying with Sherry might have been the first time that an Alaska Native student earned a PhD with an Alaska Native professor. Really? Certainly in lower 48. It might happen at UAF, but so it's it's you know these these networks of diaspora, of being in diaspora, that it is a, a native tradition of being elsewhere, right? Being otherwise, and so I don't know. I I I don't really have a, a, a ton to say other than I wanted to um, echo and of course Betty left, right? Uh, to to say that um, this list. Uh, was only really made meaningful in meeting her and, and having this network of not feeling like you're um, disconnected, that we are everywhere. And it's only a matter of changing the narrative, of having narrative change to place Alaska Native Studies, maybe not at the center, I would like to see it at the center, but you know, <laughs> not so far on the margins geographically, discourse-wise. Um, that we, we do have important things to say, and I think that my colleagues at, at Davis thankfully saw that um, when they recruited me out there, but I don't think they've had an Alaska Native out there either. I mean, there's not many of us, a hundred out of 130,000? Yeah. 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 No, no, everybody does different things. Right? So, so, yeah, I, I think that um, just being someone who, again, grew up in this era of so-called self-determination, we still have so much work to do, right? That we still have to make spaces and uh, create opportunities for students to get these degrees which are, are not easy, especially with the growing income inequalities in California. I mean, the, the issue of work-life balance and the realities of what it means to get this degree um, were hard when we did it. But they're even more compounded and worse now, um, especially in California. So the fact that we're having this conversation uh, in California is is significant. But I also wanted to, uh, returning to a point that Betty made, that um, we still can't stay in Alaska to get PhDs. I stole uh, Hannah from Alaska because they couldn't offer her fellowships. And so Hannah has one of the most impressive fellowships that we have at UC Davis, because UC Davis thankfully recognized the excellence that, that mm -hmm. Hannah represents in terms of somebody that does the kind of work that she does. Um, and, and that it's, you probably have heard of the, what I will kindly refer to as a dumpster fire that's happening in Alaska right now with uh, Dunleavy and the near dismantling of our university up there. Uh, it's. It's something that hopefully um, there are movements afoot to create hopefully a tribal college in the near future. There is a community or a two-year college on North Slope, but to have one uh, in our in kind of what has become the de facto 
urban center of Anchorage would would be immensely, immensely. Uh, it's what needs to happen. It's time, right? Fifty years later, it's it's time for that. So that's, that's basically all I wanted to say. Thank you. So we have some good time for questions and comments. So I want to open it up to everybody. We answered all your questions. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Perea? <laughs> I wonder if you might speak uh, also a little bit as to how your upcoming book manuscript <laughs> talking uh, speaks to some of the uh, scene that you were echoing at the end of, in terms of its time also that Dr. Hundorf had said we have these questions that are going forward and it, it seems to me, not that I know anything about your book manuscript, <laughs> uh, that, that, that your work t uh, speaks, speaks to some of that. And so in terms of some of the future uh, implications that you are actively dealing with at NAS with three of your graduate students sitting behind me, mm -hmm. I wonder if you might talk about how that, 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 that research is, is actively uh, addressing those questions that Dr. Hondo had, had, had left open at the, at the end of, of that part of the presentation in terms of dealing with what's going on now. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, you'd already talked about how it's dealing with what's going on with the movie, but uh, that, that, that specifics of, of, of music, I think, mm -hmm. if you might enter that into the conversation. Yeah, I suppose I failed to mention anything about music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think that um, that's also an interesting point that I was trained in musicology. I was not trained in Native American studies. I kind of did my own correspondence course in Alaska Native American as well. I was finishing my PhD, and I, I don't really need correspondence. I've taught myself. Um, uh, it's, um, I think that what, what I've noticed, at least in, in Native American studies, um, and this is something that if you're asking me what I'm thinking about in terms of my book, is that um, thankfully with Caitlin and Han, um, and to a certain degree Colton, uh, and other students at UC Davis, there's a, an emerging um, cadre of scholars who are interested in how performance, sound, media, film, dance, um, really not only expresses the differences in racialization that we feel, and so I mean, I know that Jen Rose is also working, uh, uh, a really a good friend of ours, Allison Borden, and thinking about how do we have to get Native Studies, not only to take Alaska Native Studies more seriously, but maybe more sound and media studies more seriously, dance and film, um, because we tend to, I think in the beginning maybe, and Betty could maybe speak to this more, more cogently than I can, but there used to be this thing about Native Studies being the difference-making difference machine, right? That everything we had to do was Native versus Western, which in a way, that is a binary that um, you see a lot in the early scholarship, but in terms of this era of self-determination and the density of modern indigeneity, we have, um, for example, in, in the, the work that I'm looking at, within just a, a so-called cultural area, an immense density of music cultures happening. I mean, and these music cultures that have culture cultures with them and politics and histories everything from Christian missionization and indigenizing that to uh, you know, becoming uh, part of the uh, move against, or retribalization, the move against corporations and the move to emphasize, uh, for lack of a better phrase, a, an afterborn uh, aesthetic, right? That there are those of us that, that want the next set of amendments to come, the next set of amendments to enfranchise us in that. Um, to make a change so that corporations maybe be, could be thought of differently. Maybe they could be, dare we think, more native, you know, in terms of the kinds of values and things that they do. Um, of course, that's a debate. <laughs> Whether you can indigenize an economic or corporate structure, but um, I think that, yeah, it's, um, not, I mean, we, we have long recognized, and Jack Forbes, and Vine Deloria thought about this publicly, right, in terms of self-determination or, or intellectual sovereignty. And um, 
of course we need to train people in the disciplines and to indigenous things like musicology, right? But um, I do think that there is also a need to create native music criticism, native film. I mean, we have a healthy dose of native film critics, right? But there are still all of these other areas that we have 50 more years to look forward to. Right? It's, it's exciting for that reason. But, um, 50 years later, we have a lot to celebrate, but given the ways that university administrations are morphing at the moment, uh, we have an immense amount of work ahead of us. Thank you for making me talk a little bit about music. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hey. So I did not get your name in the middle. Oh, Sherry Hundor. Last name? Hundor. Hundor. Yeah. So you talked about the Jim Crow era, mm -hmm. and I want you to kind of um, elaborate on that a little more mm -hmm. in terms of, it's kind of like a crazy shift here in America. In one sense, America wants to erase the ugly history. Mm -hmm. In another sense, especially with this current administration, mm -hmm. wants to return, wants to revert back to. Mm -hmm. So my question is, in Alaska, is that history trying to be erased? Mm -hmm. Or is it is it continuing like in so many in so many ways it's continuing here? Mm -hmm. So is there has it balanced out? Or is there still a significant difference? Hmm. Well, I, I would be really interested to hear if um, Betty and Jessica share this perception, but my own perception is Alaska is one of the, frankly, most racist places <laughs> I've ever visited, right? Like, it's like how Native people must be viewed in South Dakota, where I've never been. Mm -hmm. Alaska Native people are viewed, and there, you know, there's a lot of violence again just random violence against Alaska Native people you know they're the problems that other racialized people um, confront like, you know a few years ago that our corporation started the Alaska Native Justice Center because you know Alaska Native people um, I, I don't know what percent we are of the prison population but it's very very high you know it's way disproportionate um, um, you know, there are economic inequalities, you, you know, one of the really difficult things is in Anchorage, like, you know, walking down 4th Avenue, most of the homeless people are Alaska Native. Um, you know, it's a place of radical inequality because of racism, right? And, you know, one of the interesting things about the corporations, and, you know, there's so much to be said about the kind of contradictory effects of the corporations, like actually, you know, economic empowerment, political empowerment, funds for education, you know, you know, it's, it's paradoxically, um, the dividends from corporations have allowed some people um, in the native villages to continue with subsistence lifestyles, right, which is totally counterintuitive, right? But there, you know, there have been real detriments as well, like, you know, class stratification within the Alaska Native community. So here we are, like, we are, you know, on one end of it having benefited from the corporate funds, and then, you know, there are Native people on the street. So, no, those histories are continuing. I mean, what you said about erasure, you meant sort of correcting history. I, I initially heard it in another way, and that is that, um, there, there is very little memory of these histories, right? So like many Alaska Native people don't even know there was segregation, don't even, you know, don't even know about these things that happen because we're not taught in schools. Right. You, you, yeah. I've never taken a class in Native American studies, like let alone Alaska Native studies. And I remember being a kid in Anchorage growing up and they decided there should be like something we should do with the Native kids. And so they would like send us an hour a day to do like they would give us some beads. Like there's no <laughs> teaching us anything, right? Like this, yeah. there's no bead work. No, that was like here's some beads. Like, that was in the meditation <laughs> class too. They send us to a real yeah. cannibal, put us in front of the beads, and be like, yeah, you know, yeah, you right? do. <laughs> <laughs> Taking us out of science and math to do that. We never learned. Was like I never learned these things until I left Alaska, yeah. right? Yeah. So that wasn't the kind of ratio you were mentioning. You were no. referring to, but that, but that is a kind of ratio. So no, these racial dynamics are ongoing, they're complicated, and um, yeah. And, and thankfully, um, just to add that, Carolyn, 
there are um, a lot of Alaska Native media makers. Like media is one of the things that we've, we've had um, kind of our own self-governance over since at least 1998. And uh, they're, they're great. Um, not only has Elizabeth Fredovich Day been recognized as a state holiday, but there are documentaries about that particular anti-discrimination law that was passed in 1945. And so thinking about um, just how, again, these these at least creative products are being put out there to tell these histories. Um, but yeah, that, that folks in rural Alaska are feeling unevenly the benefits of the corporate system is, is a major problem. Even just in, in uh, the difference between Anchorage and what they see as the kind of white trash valley where I grew up. Um, lots of natives there, so um, yeah. Demographics are a really interesting thing to look at and, um, you know, Alaska has, it's one of the smallest, I think it's the second least populated state. Um, at one point there was a study done in the Alaska State Department of Civil Rights and it was determined that Alaska Native people got 600% more jail time than non-Natives. I wouldn't. I don't know what it would be like out here, but I think state to state, that would be a really interesting thing to look at. Mm -hmm. um, in the 2000 uh, U.S. Census of Population, um, the average lifespan of Indians across the country was 45. Um, 37 um, in Alaska and Arizona. Um, in the 2010 census of population, um, the average lifespan of Indians across the board was 43. It went down by two years. 35 in Alaska and Arizona. Demographically, we're in a disaster zone. And I think one of the things that when you do study whatever it is you study, it's good to, to kind of uh, think about what goes on from where you came from. And I strongly recommend, this is a really great idea that I think any, almost any level of uh, uh, education could do, is an environmental history of your state. Wouldn't that be interesting? Um, when I was working on my, um, uh, background for my paper, I couldn't figure out why everything seemed to happen in San Francisco that pertained to Alaska. <laughs> the Alaska Commercial Company, which was in charge of all the uh, trading and everything, uh, was based at 300 Sansom Street. I bless it annually. <laughs> um, and I couldn't figure out why. And just not very long ago, one of my friends from Washington said, Eddie, Washington wasn't even a state yet. <laughs> California was made a state to keep mm -hmm. California from the Confederacy in the Civil War. If the South had California on their side, they might have won it. Uh, we're not going to replay that one again. <laughs> um, and California, therefore, was in charge of U.S. interests, it kind of took the place of um, St. Louis. St. Louis was the western frontier. Mm -hmm. And then it leaped over places like Arizona and Me New Mexico, it didn't become states until 1912. Mm -hmm. The Alaska State Constitution was lifted almost verbatim mm -hmm. uh, from the California State Constitution, along with all of its uh, in, uh, racism. Mm -hmm. So that one of the big biggest effects of the civil rights law of 1964 in both California and Alaska was that the 16 groups that were discriminated against in real estate, it was no longer legal. It transformed California. Those of us of color who owned in California, we couldn't have bought them. The records of wherever you grew up, if it was built before 1964, it has a racial covenant. Mm -hmm. The veneer of California being liberal, mm -hmm. I consider a pretty uh, thin veneer. <laughs> um, 
My name is Ben. <laughs> uh, I'm in a American New Studies major, but also I'm a cinema minor, so it's more pertaining to you, Dr. Prasad. Right? Um, so you talk about film criticism, and you've talked about media, particularly in the lower 48. Though we don't really have any just filmmakers, we have a lot more from Canada. Mm -hmm. And so, how do we pertain to that? That's what my field work is really going towards: is not so much criticism, but actually activity. In that you know, you know, you point out to something like that. It's sort of my attitude. I've and I think uh, Dr. Perry has left, but I say, how do we get Indians into playing golf more? How do we close deals? I was a state champion in so, golf. So there you go. <laughs> I was the, the Palmer state so. champion. So you know how to close deals better than most people. <laughs> well, I wish. you, you got to take it the demographics so. that you're golfing with. It wasn't quite okay. like Nevada. But sorry, your question about how... So yeah, so do you, can you point in the sense of how was that kind of created? You talked about the media making mm -hmm. up in Alaska. Mm -hmm. But particularly in California, being the state of movie yeah. making, but now going to the southeast. Yeah, right. I mean, if you think about Hollywood, I yeah. mean, one of the things we were talking about at lunch actually was um, the the documentary film that I love so much by Neil Diamond, The Real Engines, and just how they end basically, or he ends with the thesis that the future is in the north, right? That Asuma TV and Zacharias Kunick are the way of the future, and have really happened for the last two decades. And Sherry's written about this in her book and. Uh, and some really great articles about Adon Arjuat, um, which I think you should all be required reading. You all must read Dr. <laughs> Kundorf's work. Uh, so I mean, you could, you, she could also speak to this, but um, just in terms of, uh, it, it's an interesting thing, maybe because of our recent histories, right? And because of the differences in settler colonialism. I mean, a lot of people say that because settler colonialism came so late that language, native language retention was able to be maintained in a lot of villages, like unless, except for maybe the kids that were taken away for boarding schools and you know basically beaten the native language down. A lot of the villages in Alaska maintained their languages, and with those languages, maintained the storytelling, maintained the singing and dancing um, uh, practices, and so you have that ancient media that never went away. Um, but then you look at a place like where my ancestors are from, which was on the road system, which is, you know, Talkeetna, where my mom's uh, family, the railroad, they had to m literally move and relocate my grandfather's house to make room for the railroad to go through to get the gold out mm -hmm. of Fairbanks, right? So you, you have this very different erasure happening um, on the road system, at least in Alaska. But anyway, the, um, the question about maybe why, or just improvising off the top of my head in terms of why we see so much more in the North is probably because of the very different political realities that Dr. Hundorf laid out in terms of a corporate versus a reservation system. There's, mm. there's more capital coming out of a capitalist system. Imagine that. Um, in Canada, um, it maybe it has more to do with also just this supposed isolationist, right? That not many people want to move into our, our areas. So a lot of creativity is maintained and you know, you give you give a native a camera, you're gonna you're gonna get some pretty awesome uh, footage out of it. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing you love more than <laughs> selfies. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can think about all of you know, anybody, right? But it's um, I don't know, Sherry I, I imagine you have something to say about that too. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And as you were talking I was, you know, going back to many years ago I visited um, what used to be Bear Hunter, the audit. Um, and the North Shield Corporation started mm -hmm. something called the Eskimo Channel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's the Eskimo Channel. Um, and you know, they just sort of, it was really interesting to visit because they, you know, they were filming, like, people going hunting, we want to preserve this, you know, help teach our young people, they're doing language stuff. But I don't think any of it circulated, right? Like, that was all for community. Um, that was all for community use, but they had the resources to do it. Mm -hmm. Like the you okay? Yeah. yeah. You think about radio right. and TV. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And even Candia, right? Mm -hmm. Like this sort of large-scale radio enterprise in Alaska days, and that's for corporate money. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think it's that. But there has been, you know, since the kind of democratization of media with accessibility of technology starting in the 70s. I mean, there is actually a lot of independent native filmmaking in the lower 48, mm -hmm. too. And probably some of it will be shown in, when is the next American Indian Film Festival? It's actually November, right? Yeah. 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 Oh, was it October? Yeah, okay. yeah the, um, 
When I was doing my field work in Bethel, um, the public TV station, the equivalent of KQED, is KYUK. The talk show is Youth to Youth. Um, <laughs> um, they, they do the radio station, the NPR, and they do the TV station, and they translate everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The ABC donated, I don't know if they do it now, but I sure hope they do, they donated the ABC News to KYUK. You put the screen up, you take a teenager on this side and a teenager on that side, and they simultaneously translate the news to Yupik. Mm -hmm. So if you're not cognizant, uh, you know, fluent in Yupik, you don't, you see what's going on, but you don't know what's happening. Um, and the um, one day I turned out uh, to you, um, or the, the radio station, and this Eskimo lady was just talking and talking and talking and talking. Uh, there was a pulmonary specialist who had come to Bethel, and he was taking uh, call-ins from 66 villages. I mean, distance learning is nothing to us. <laughs> and, and so this lady was just talking and talking, and the, the doctor, uh, when she stopped, he said, I said that. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> uh, and, um, we have a lot of Indian humor about, you know, when people say, "Oh, I have to, I have to understand my own language." So, oh, there they go again. Um, but in some ways, I think we're in the media. We have a lot we can do with the media that we don't. We're almost limited by our own lack of imagination, that there are things that we can do. For example, I did a show in public broadcast in Hayward, and the show uh, that um, was taping, not at the same time, but had uh, at that same period of time, um, was a show from the California School for the Deaf. And that's a very high-tech studio, a high um, up to the arts at the time, and the filming part is in the center and it's uh, like we would be in the center there'd be glass all around us and uh, the deaf community came and said we want to do a deaf show and they said oh no you can't do that and they said why not so because you have to have the microphones on uh, the earphones and talk to the um, control room and they said but we can see each other we sign <laughs> and the, uh, you know, you, it, it's a public, it's like borrowing a, a book from the library. You've got to let them try it. And they, oh, well, it probably won't work, but let them do it. That show went national. It was like a hit mm -hmm. for deaf news for deaf people. Mm -hmm. And they had everything going. It was up to an hour by the time I saw it. And in some ways, I think the idea, like if we if we can get our languages, like I'm, I'm planning to do some of the curriculum that was developed here online for people in prisons, well, there's no reason why we couldn't teach it in their language. We could take the sound off of whatever this is being, you know, and then uh, put it on in, our, in, in another language. And um, Canada, I don't know what the secret is to Canada, First Nations uh, experience, but there's a lot more um, government uh, support of native arts, mm -hmm. which we have, we, we really need that. We really need that in a big way. Um, and uh, the churches, um, the, the Christian churches in Canada made formal apologies to the native communities that they had harmed. And, we're working on it, but it's a slow process. <laughs> so there's plenty for you to do with all of you getting your degrees and doing your thing. Come to us, we have ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we have actually um, an event, a different event that starts in this room very quickly, but I wanted to take a moment to thank our speakers for getting Red Talk Talk program. ever on a day like today. That's <laughs> all I can say. <laughs> so, but thank you all for coming and we look forward to very many more talks this, um, this semester. So thank you.